Okay, so we start with logic and specifically propositional logic may be the most elementary form of logic. And we will build our way uh, up towards first order logic later on, and then we'll study a little bit elementary set theory where we will use concepts from logic in, in, in definitions of certain operations. Okay, so what is propositional logic? Propositional logic is studying um, relationships and operations on propositions. Essentially, we would like to find a, um, a mathematical way to represent um, declarations or statements, and would like to assign root values to them and work on their operations. Now, what's a proposition? That's the first definition. We need a declarative sentence that can be assigned a truth value. Okay, a truth value, by the truth value, we mean either true or false, right? In propositional logic, um, a proposition can either be true or false. It cannot be both true or false, and it cannot be neither true nor false, right? A proposition uh, is a statement that conveys information that is either unequivocally true or false, okay? It has to take one of those values. And here you see some examples to propositions, I am alive. This is a statement that has information and you know that it is true, obviously when uttered by a person, therefore you can assign um, a truth value to this statement, which makes it a proposition. One plus one equals true. Now, obviously this is not an English sentence, it's a mathematical sentence, but clearly it's a statement that has information, right? And we can assign a truth value to it, which is true. Very similarly, one plus one equals three is also a proposition, but a false one. And number four, example number four, here we see actually um, a statement from first order logic. And it reads, if you're not familiar with this, it reads, for all X, there exists a Y such that X by Y makes zero. Okay, so this is how we read it. And in fact, we are going to study first order logic next week. Right, so this is a statement um, when um, you actually translate this to plain English, it would read, uh, for all possible values of X, there would exist a Y value such that when you add them up, they make zero, right? So this is a proposition. And let's look at some examples that are not propositions. Come here, it's not a proposition because well, um, it's an imperative sentence. It's not a declarative sentence. It does not convey information. It's not a statement, right? It does not provide information that you can assign a truth value. Like, is this true? Is this false? There is no such thing. It doesn't make sense. So it's not a proposition. Um, let's take a look at the second example. X plus Y equals zero. Now, this looks mathematical, so you might want to think that this is a proposition, but it is not. The reason is we do not know the values of x and y, and therefore, since it looks like it conveys information, you cannot really assign a truth value to the statement. I don't know if it is true, I don't know if it is false, so it's not a proposition. Unless I know the values of x and y, I cannot judge the truth value of this statement. So it's not a proposition. Now you see the distinction between this one and this one may not be apparent, but you see the quantifiers here actually make this statement a proposition because it's different to say for all X, there is a Y value such that X plus Y equals zero, but that is different from just plainly saying X by Y equals zero. Right, so there's a distinction between this one and this one. And the second one is not a proposition. Now to represent propositions, we usually use small case letters, P, Q, R are the customary ones, but not necessarily. And obviously um, 
the truth values true and false are our constants, logical constants. And sometimes we represent true with a capital T or sometimes with this symbol, again, resembling um, a T and sometimes by one in certain contexts, especially in electrical engineering. And on the other hand, we have false. Sometimes we represent it with an F and sometimes we represent it with this. So usually when you see this, you call a contradiction, right? Essentially, uh, this is the symbol that represents false, okay? And sometimes we obviously represent false with a zero. Right, so now that we, we have the definition of a proposition, we can talk about the first operation, which is negation, right? So this is a very simple operation. It produces the logical complement of a proposition, right? What's a complement? The complement of true is false and the complement of false is true. So you just negate the value of the proposition or rather you change the value, okay? So it gives false if the proposition is true and vice versa, right? So if, if you have a proposition that is false, when you negate it, you get true. And if it is true, when you negate it, you, you get false. Now, this is the representation we use to denote negation. Actually, it's one of the representations we use. We can use this one. So sometimes you can use this one. And you can see some books use this with a tilde or sometimes with, with a prime. These are all um, representations we can use to denote negation, depending on the context. Now, one important point is that negation is a unary operator. And th this is a term you need to get accustomed to a unary operator, binary operator, ternary operator, etc. So the number of inputs that the operation requires is given in this, in this term, unary. So that means negation requires only one input. Not only requires, but well, you cannot actually put in two inputs to negation. Doesn't make sense, right? It accepts a single input. So it's a unary operator. Now, let's see a very simple example. Let's say that the um, the proposition P is this computer has at least one gigabytes of RAM. When I negate it, it reads, it is not the case that this computer has at least one gigabytes of RAM. Now, this is the easy way to do a negation. It's not the case that such and such, okay? But in plain English or natural language, we do not talk like that usually. So you need to be smart about this. So this computer has less than one gigabytes of RAM, right? The original proposition was has at least one gigabytes. So when you negate that, it simply becomes, it has less than one gigabytes of RAM. 